In late 1962, the then governor, Ernest Hep Hollings, who had won the governorship as a segregationist, he had campaigned not in the Ross Barnett or the Paul Johnson matter, but he would campaigned as a segregationist nonetheless, began to hold meetings off the record with newspaper men. He didn't pay much attention to TV and radio folks, and nobody did in those days. Everything was the press. He said, you need to prepare your readers for a change. It's coming. And it's certainly going to come on the next governor's watch. And that would absolutely be true. The Gantt case was in the courts. Now, what is interesting in South Carolina, before a decision was reached in the Gantt case, and it's going all the way through the federal courts, again, this was the state was defending. Matthew Perry and the other attorneys were proceeding from court to court. Before a decision was rendered, the state's business leadership pledged support for the peaceful desegregation of Clemson College. So did the State Chamber of Commerce, the Bankers Association, the Broadcasters Association, leading textile executives. Senator Edgar Brown described the behind scenes of business, political, and civic leaders in 1962 and the rest of the decade as a conspiracy for peace. And as a historian and as a political scientist, Phil Gross and I have been through the McNair papers. And I remember sitting at a dinner one night with Governor McNair on one side and Judge Perry on the other. And they began having a conversation about a meeting. And they mentioned a date. And I just said, Governor, I've seen your log. Judge Perry's not on your calendar. And he just looked at me and he said, well, now Walter, we don't, didn't write everything down in those days. About a month ago, I had the pleasure of being with Judge Perry and I mentioned that story to him. And he said, we had lots of meetings. So did Addie Quincy Newman, who was head of the state at NAACP. He said, we met with Governor McNair many times. He said, we worked things out. He said, we cut deals. That's his phrase. You can ask him about that tomorrow. But what you have here is a conversation taking place across racial lines that wasn't happening anywhere else. And yes, it was done out of the press because that's the only way you could make progress. Then the decision came out and uh, it was done. It was over. 1963, many people call the year of decision in South Carolina. Donald Russell is governor, Robert E. McNair is lieutenant governor. Uh, it opens with Governor Russell holding the first desegregated public slash social affair in South Carolina since Reconstruction by having a barbecue on the, on the governor's mansion grounds. And very shortly thereafter, the courts rule in favor of Harvey Gantt's admission to Clemson. This is something that Russell and McNair have to deal with. And they did so effectively. Clemson desegregated without incident. South Carolina was the last southern state to admit persons of color to its formerly all-white colleges. But 1963 was a year of violence across the American South, if you remember what I've talked about earlier but not in South Carolina. But it does not mean that everything was quiet. The state NAACP, led by Ida, the Reverend Ida Quincy Newman, published a list of nine demands that they would like to see happen. It included take down the white only and colored only signs, which still existed in our state. If you went to any Main Street store in Columbia when there still was, were stores on Main Street or King Street stores in Charleston, in some cases, African Americans were not allowed to go in there, or if they were, they were never allowed to try on clothes. There were no black clerks. Uh, if there were persons of color employed, they were somebody, uh, usually a female in a maid's uniform who was sort of keeping things tidy. But they published a list of demands that basically said, okay, let's get rid of this white only, colored only. Let's have meaningful employment for persons of color. Let's have a little bit of dignity. For example, in a newspaper like the state newspaper, if they published a, an article, they would talk about Dr. Fred Carter or Mr. Fred Carter 
But if he happened to be a person of color, they might just call him Fred in print. No honorific, no title of courtesy. Simple things that we take for, we take for granted today, but were very much a part of the Southern way of life in the 1960s. And the Reverend Newman announced that eight cities, Charleston, Columbia, Florence, Greenville, Orangeburg, Rock Hill, Spartanburg, and Sumter, would be the scene of demonstrations unless progress was made in dismantling the most uh, of Jim Crow. In Columbia, the mayor was Lester Bates, who was closely tied in with what was called the Barnwell Ring, of which the governor, Governor McNair, was a member. And within days after a hard-headed meeting with the, the city's Chamber of Commerce and the business community, the white and colored only signs disappeared. The local Chamber of Commerce encouraged the training and hiring of persons of color. Uh, and in Florence, Greenville, Rock Hill, and Spartanburg, black and white residents reached accommodation quickly and formed biracial committees. The only place of intransigence was Orangeburg. City officials and businesses were absolutely obdurate. They were not going to change their minds. And attitudes hardening on both sides of the racial divide would lead to increased tensions that it would explode in violence and bloodshed in 1968. Other towns that were not even on the list of the big places, Anderson, Beaufort, Greenwood, Newberry, acted on their own initiative with the careful prodding of the state's business and political leadership. Now, across the state, many communities made tremendous progress in eliminating racial barriers. It was not always easy. Repealing laws and form forming biracial committees, however, did not mean that people uh, had changed their hearts and minds. In Charleston, Mayor Gilliard said that the recalcitrant white population was the real problem. He said merchants who took down white-only signs were subject to hate mail and white boycotts. And there was the steady drumbeat of racist editorials from the city's newspaper. Nevertheless, in the judgment of a number of historians of the 20th century South, the state with the population that was described as emotionally the deepest deep South state of all showed more flexibility than anyone would have anticipated. And that was because of leadership. The state had chosen a middle way, compromise if you will, but the path was going to be nonviolent. Yes, there would be civil rights demonstrations, but nobody was going to beat up on the demonstrators like they did in Birmingham or Americas or Jacksonville. That's a big difference. The local officials may not have liked the fact that they were demonstrators, but it did not happen. And now we come to the administration of Governor McNair, 1965 to 1970. And I'd like to repeat what Senator Brown talked about, the conspiracy for peace. What this man did as governor, whether it was meeting with Addie Quincy Newman or Matthew Perry, our town mayors, our county officials, or on occasion, strong-arming members of the General Assembly. His job was to make sure that South Carolina was not Alabama or Mississippi or Louisiana. Mm -hmm. 